London School of Economics and also the um, uh, the Columbia University and he obtained a uh, uh, MBA the, at the Columbia University. Uh, and he is working on engineering and finance at a very wide range. So t today, he, he will talk about the models for growth and uh, financing of micro, small, and medium enterprise in times of the recession. So the, also, I, I'd like to inform, tomorrow, unfortunately, uh, Professor Dr. Joseph Choi uh, cannot uh, come to the, uh, Japan because of his uh, schedule. So I asked him to talk the another topics. So please expect the uh, another topics. So the uh, Professor the Agawa, uh, can you start now? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Please start. I would like to thank uh, Nunzo to have considered to invite me um, at the TCME 2014 to deliver the keynote address and uh, the members of the advisory board and the council. Um, I, uh, the topic which we have chosen today for the speech is the model for growth and financing of micro, small and medium sized enterprises in times of recession. And uh, uh, they have, over the last century or so, have shown very categorically and very clearly, empirical evidence is there, uh, corporate evidence is there, which clearly outlines the fact, the way uh, the MSMEs have actually uh, financed the growth of various nations and corporations around the globe, despite uh, uh, recessions which have been hit by man-made structures like the wars, or uh, creation of dams and structures, uh, other structures, or natural disasters like famines or tornadoes and so on and so forth. We have seen most of these organizations have been the rescue uh, mechanism for growth. And in the last 25 years, we have developed a large number of models which have been implemented by corporates, both large and small. We have integrated some of those models uh, and presented this work here. Also, Junzo requested me to give a little bit outlay on um, the Indian and MSME segment. Uh, in my paper, I have focused on both India and Uzbekistan because the last presentation, last last presentation I made was in Uzbekistan on this issue. So there was a conference in Uzbekistan, which I will focus less, but would be there as well. Um, all these works uh, are ours and the omissions are ours. Uh, if there are problems, you're most welcome to get back to us. We'll be happy to rectify. And uh, being at the World Bank 15 years back, I learned that I need to make the statement while I'm there. I am thankful to some of the people who have consulted in the last 15-20 years for various works and some of these works have been compiled here. The earlier versions I have had the honor to present at the Italian parliament, the Uzbek parliament, the, the Uzbek government and uh, some of the other forums as well. The focus of uh, the paper uh, typically is, uh, I go on this, the first section which actually talks about the 
the economy and all, I will uh, restrain this because given the time limit, which we have about an hour, hour and a half or so, I will restrain that component per se and move on directly to the second component, which is the, the building of the models and the models which we propose in terms of restructuring and empowering the MSMEs uh, to go forward. Um, but initially, I will give a brief layout in some of these segments and as to why the need has come in and how has some of these MSMEs functioned and uh, created to this growth momentum in these regions. And this is the way, as I said, we will lay out our presentation. A uh, very important component is uh, the way we look at the, the world today, the way things are, and the role uh, of finance, uh, which is uh, a love to me, uh, comprises of more than any other component per se. You see, uh, we're looking at a world which is a combination of technology and environment and ecology. There is an extensive debate for the last 25 years, uh, which has been given due concern in the last 10, 15 years after the Nobel Prize and the Water Prize and a couple of other prizes have been focused. The governments have come together to meet talking about environment. It was never an issue. Though uh, developing regions or emerging markets uh, discount this factor uh, for the fact that they need to have that growth which the developed countries have enjoyed for the last 50 years, and they would not like to uh, you know, reduce that growth on the count of environment. Uh, despite that, they are also concerned because it is a matter of concern for everyone living on this earth. So it is a question that if there will be no tomorrow, what are we having this growth and development for? What are we developing technology or any kind of a model or any kind of a sustainable structure for if there are no people here to live? It's not for the, the animals or the other inhabitants of this planet, but it's primarily for the mankind. So it's a combination of technology and environment and ecology which actually has been uh, boosting in sustainable growth. Employment and growth have been two concerns which have been worrying governments over al almost about a century or so. If you go back 200, 300 years prior to that civilization, they never worried about employment and growth. Their own, own structure was only uh, sustainability, bringing in structures, bringing placements and rules and regulations for the kingdoms and the domains to function. It was never on employment. But last century, we have seen an extensive function. So it is found the technology environment and sustainable development. The prime purpose is bringing in employment and growth. But what binds them together, what actually brings them together, is nothing else but uh, the, uh, the finance. It is something which binds them together. If we do not have finance, we will not have technology come in place. We have to have finance, whether it is R&D, whether it is creating a, a structure, a model, its chair, or, or this uh, phone or laptop, you need finance. You need finance even for environment and ecology. It cannot be social services, good. But unless there are allocations by NGOs or governments or international agencies, we don't think they're coming into place again. So combinations of all of this contributing to economic employment and growth and ultimately to sustainable development, it is bounded by this word finance. Yeah. And we have seen in the last 15 years how corporations worldwide have actually diminished off. Even economies like the United States of America has gone to doldrums because of the facts the way finance and the banking industry has suffered in the last four or five years. Whether it's Europe or US, they are facing huge debacles, legal issues, civil right problems, not because they have, don't have educated people, not because they don't have technology, not because they don't have environment or ecology, or they don't have sustainable systems, but just because of the fact finance is a big issue. Where do you get it from? And that's where I feel uh, that finance is the one which binds this structure. Uh, this is something, some of the things which we are seeing today and uh, have been observed for the last 10, 15 years. We're looking at uh, global disequilibrium, interdependence of a world which is coming today. We're not looking at a world which is unipolar or bipolar or tripolar or four-polar or, or multipolar. We're looking at an interdependent. We're looking at working together, moving to connect together. And that's what's very critical. And that's where the emergence and needs for MSMEs, which used to be only contributing to their small region before, or a small state or a society, today are looking at MSMEs contributing to the world. India imports large amount of their equipments and other things which are manufactured in China by MSMEs in small, small states. And we are not large corporations which are shipping. 50 years back or even 30 years back, it was large corporations which will do the tie-ups and then they will ask their MSMEs to produce for them and then they will ship it out as an export component. But today, the, the outside party has a direct link to a small MSME in anywhere in the world. And that's where the, the 
equitable growth in terms of sustainable development coming together is critical. We're looking at growth, unemployment, and labor, which are still very critical and important issues before the governments, and as I said, primarily because of the diminishing finances which they have, both in terms of tax revenue collections, as well as in terms of the, the corporate functionalities. Establishing balance between the need of survival, social, economic, and environment discipline, which is very critical today, it's a matter of concern, whether you're an emerging economy or a developed economy, people live in the same environment. In America, I read an article in Economist from about 15, 16 years back in 2000 or so, which talked about the level of pollution which America makes as compared to the rest of the world, and the kind of dumping which takes place in America, both in terms of non-toxic and toxic material, is almost over uh, 15 times that compared to any developed country in the world. So, you know, the levels, but who are the ultimate resultants? It's every one of us who gets to bear all the costs. So it's not A country or B country doing it, all of us are and they are actually worried about it. Strengthening the energy markets, financial markets, energy has become a very key component for almost all functionalities today. Uh, the services sector depends on energy because whether it's laptop services, doing textuals, no one is used to now using old traditional techniques. I remember in seeing in Japan people still riding on bicycles, but you rest the rest of the world you go around, uh, hardly anyone rides on bicycles or what like to travel. They typically use all automobiles, energy-based mechanisms, and it's become so much dependent that if there is no energy for even a single day, people panic. And that's where the need for uh, strengthening these markets, uh, emerging markets suffer from sufficient energy to be supplied to the people, and that's where they need to work even more uh, aggressively on this. Focusing on issues of building sustainable development, more regulatory prudence in central banking, banking and market response, you'll be surprised and shocked. Despite the debacle we have been going in for 15 years in the financial industry worldwide, last four years openly visible by the developed region of the world in some developing countries as well. Despite all these things, none of the banks have actually put their house in order. The NPA levels, the kind of problems they have suffering, the kind of products they have, even in the United States. The central bank governors are sitting over the loans. They're not even instructing the banks either to close or to resolve that issue. They're sitting and saying, if good times will come, these things will automatically settle off. Which is a very, very nomadic style which 100 years back was okay, but not in today's time. But it is a shocking thing which we see in the banking economy. And if this continues, we will see this recession which we are seeing and bearing for another five years to go ahead before it can actually think about stabilizing. And this is something which we have worked on also, but today we will not be discussing on this financial stability in the work we have an implemented model which we have produced for this. These are some of the works which I feel are critical, uh, beginning with Chanakya's Cotillia, which was, which is the first ever written book in economics. Uh, people who love economics, uh, I would suggest it's uh, easily available, very cheap uh, in the world, uh, in various publishers have published it worldwide. It is the first book which talks about the way kingdom is to be run, the way economics is to be run. The only difference is you replace the uh, kingdom with the government, the king with the, with the ruler, the ruling party or the ruler, and the civilians remain the civilians. Everything else in this book is even functioning today after it was written in 4th century, 350 BCE. So almost 2,400 years back it was written. And this work is even functioning today. Adam Smith's work is not functioning today although he's referred to his father with noise. From my perspective, a text which is much, much older and function today is, is due to be given credit to be referred to as father of economics. Professor Agrawal's work on global programming model, which has been utilized by MSMEs extensively. Some of my works, Joseph Stiglitz's work, Martin Wood's uh, work, which was there in 2005, which was integrating economies in terms of trade barriers and structures, which actually showed clearly that the way uh, SME segment benefits from this integration process of the world economies in terms of trade. And some of the other, Mario Baldassari, he will be the Deputy Prime Minister of NPK, and uh, his works, he has been a professor before, I have also talked about some of these integration processes. The Yamini's work, which has been there on the capital structure decisions in terms of dynamicity, because today, uh, capital structures can't be the old style, equity debt, and we fix on it, and then we sit down, relax comfortably, and once in a while, in a decade or so, we restructure it, reorient the mix, and then go ahead. Now, you're looking at a dynamic world today. The large number of financing organizations are there. Uh, small companies, they need to be dynamic. Large companies are lethargic in terms of restructuring their capital structure. They have a lot of restrictions also, but small companies do not have those structures. And they need to be more adaptive to the environment. And that's where they have been a survivor as against the large corporations worldwide. And this particular model, uh, stochastic programming model, helps 
for them to restructure and say what is the best mix which they can have on an annual or even a semi-annual basis. And this is what actually we have tested in about eight or nine firms and it has worked very well for them. Uh, some of the, we have seen the way crisis have been hitting us, 80s and so on and so forth, even today, the way unemployment has been growing, even in the United States, even today, uh, the officially, uh, they, they talk about around 9 or 10 percent, but unofficially, it is over 18 percent, there is a disguise unemployment, which is there extensively. And this is not the case only with the United States, it's the case with a large number of economies around the world. Uh, on the name of, uh, uh, you know, providing subsidies, on the name of providing uh, Entrepreneurship, they are actually having this guy's unemployment because one doesn't want to say he's unemployed, he says, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing this particular job, where actually he is not earning anything per se. And that's where the problem for most governments come in, and that's why the need for boosting up the MSME segment is more. The oil volatility factor also has been impacting large economies, both oil producing and oil consuming economies per se. We suggested something called oil pool account way back in 1991, which has been actually adopted by various countries. Uh, oil importing countries have used it in terms of uh, shielding themselves against the international oil price volatility. And the developed economies like Norway have used it in terms of taking care of pension funds. So they use the same account, the same kind of structure. The only difference is they don't use it against shielding against oil volatility, but they use it against the uh, the pensions which they are unable to pay, so they use that fund for funding the, the pensions. Uh, apart from that, we have developed some models which have also been used. As I said, I will be brushing through this first portion of the section, uh, given the time. Uh, the money laundering has also been a major concern for most economies around the world. It has been on an increase, increase in trend. Uh, it is estimated $2.5 trillion uh, on an annual basis, that is 5.5 to 6% of the world uh, GDP. We are looking at even uh, more now with the GDP having fallen, uh, which is actually contributing to the money laundering and the way business goes on. A huge chunk of this money goes into the MSME sector, which is the unregulated MSME sector. It is not that this, this is done by only large corporations. Large corporations do get involved in terms of doing the money laundering activity and using banks and stuff. But actually this one who is the end user who gets this fund is actually a large segment of the MSME sector which is unregulated to the extent. And that's why this becomes a concern because that sector needs to grow, that needs to be sustainable. And at times countries uh, are pledged, the Colombia is there, you know, they have, they have no option but to sustain uh, drugs uh, production. You know, it's been an uh, open case for over 50 years now. They, they openly say it, we have no option, we have to sustain our people, we have to sustain their product. And so we do it. You know, some economies are accepting it. Italy accepts mafia to be the largest economy for Italy. But, you know, they're not most economies will accept. But this this money, large part of it actually gets swindled through the MSME. And that's where the, the functioning of the MSME needs to be brought into a check because this money can actually result in developments for various economies. And whatever the growth they develop can be diminished off because of this component. Something which uh, I proposed long back, uh, this is something which I proposed in 1999, out of which we have already seen the European Constitution uh, being a draft of the that being brought in 2004, enlargement already taking place. These two things which I have proposed and have been discussing at various European forums have still not been introduced in a formal way, but informally, both of them, national identity also as a, a European today says is a European, he doesn't talk about being a German or French or a Spanish per se. Earlier, uh, ten years back, he went, he would say, I'm a Spanish, I'm a German, I'm a Portuguese, I'm a, I'm a so and so, but today he says I'm a European. And that's where the national identity function has come in place today, but not accepted even today. The Fiscal Policy Board is also in discussion. Various finance ministers meet on a monthly or a bi-monthly basis, and they discuss on these issues, regional basis, not if people meet separate, Southern European meet, meet separately, because they have common interest. And that's where they've been trying to do it, but still no formal structure is there. For this. So we are expecting something of these things coming in another five years. But this is something which the paper which I had written presented in various forums had, had come to light. Now this, today, last ten years, you might have observed and you would notice that the beneficiaries of this are the employment growth which has come from, from the smaller segments. The large companies which were there in some of the developed Europe have actually benefited by cheap labor, cheap land and cheap structures. 
Apart from this, the MSME segments have actually moved. The micro has become small, the small has become medium. It is primarily because of the kind of growth impetus which was provided by the European institutions and uh, which provide fund, which provide development, which provide that handshake between the developed region of Europe and the underdeveloped region of Europe. And that's where the growth in the segment has been shifting one level up. It's been a decade. We have seen this happen more rigorously in the last 10 years as compared to previous. And that's where this integration process is critical. And this is what I have proposed. And this we, we, I hope we get to see it in our lifetime. I don't know. But it's, it's a research work, so let's see what comes out from there. Now, I will not go into this. Uh, some of the advantages, we have seen some of them come up. I will, as I said, I will skip this portion. Uh, the economic development uh, is positively correlated to economic growth, the GDP contributions uh, by the services sector in large part of the developed world is 6 to 80 percent. In India, we have about 70 percent of population engaged in civil agriculture. Most countries have on an average about 2 to 3 percent in large part of the world. Even in emerging markets today, not more than 5 percent of population, except for China and India and maybe two or three other nations, we have where they have more than 50 percent of population engaged in agriculture. Rest countries have moved to about 3 to 5 percent, or in developed regions even 1 to 2 percent. Your large number of European nations and America, a large of the top North America, so typically 1 to 3 percent only, which is engaged in agriculture. And that's where the focus of agriculture is still there in some of these countries, but the rest of them, they are not there. And we have seen in the last five years of the recession coming, large number of people have moved back from the large corporations to set up MSMEs in the agro-based industry segment, in India at least. And I'll come to that later when I talk about India. And that's where uh, the focus on the service sector has been important, but uh, and has been contributing more. Even in India today, the service sector contributes more in terms of growth. And that is where it becomes very important for us to see that how can we actually focus on. Because the service sector, large number of these corporations are in the micro segment. There are very few of them which are in the medium or large scale. They are, very, they are the largest chunk, largest pie of the chart of the corporations are in the micro segment. So it's one man, two man, three man organization which are running the services segment and doing fairly very well worldwide. Some of these companies uh, we, we have seen uh, as part of the venture capital growth. Uh, I laid down by going back to 527 BCE. And this is where we have seen the MSME come into play and they grow as venture capitalists, ventures. Nalanda University, one of the first universities to be set up in the world uh, by uh, Kumar, Kumar Gupta, the, uh, the venture capitalist in India. Then there was Takshila, which was set up by King Takshila in 518 BCE in India. Chandragupta Maurya Empire was there. Then 350 BCE to 832, Chanakya Patel's work came into place. Then you have the colonization of Isabel Queen, which was in this. This was uh, the Christopher Columbus expedition. Again, uh, uh, a new structure which had come in, a venture capital structure which had come in, it was never experienced before. Alexander Cotton Mill by Jamshedji Tata, which is a large corporation today. Uh, I learned the other day that in Japan this month, the, the leading uh, business newspaper is going to talk about the Tata group and the way they have grown and so on and so forth. Uh, from an MSME, a person who would move, who was a street hawker, who would move on his shoulders with cloths and structure and selling those to uh, people living in the society, in, in houses, to a large corporation today over a span of 100 years. Clearly a venture capitalist. The Rocks Company, General Motors, IBM, a large number of such companies that we see. Uh, I'll send uh, the paper to Dunzo and maybe we can uh, circulate it amongst the participants for their benefit. Uh, this is somewhere we have seen the, some of the others. Lichit Papad, again I'll discuss this later, uh, is, a, is an MSME which talks about people being utilized from the small, small towns and villages uh, for creation of some of these products which is uh, which is a edible uh, food which is created by people in the villages and there is nothing, it's, it's a corporation which is still an MSME segment corporation, one of the most profitable corporations and it was started in 1959 and it has been accepted, it was started by a group of women, uh, it was not one person who started it, so we have seen this kind of venture capitalists, some of them sponsored by kings or kingdoms but most of them not and they have been. Infosys today which you talk about in IT, four people together with almost no fund, uh, their wives gave their jewelry to finance this corporation to come into play. Today is a multi company. Now they move one level up uh, looking at and that's where we have seen growth of some of the venture funds or MSMEs come into play. VLCC it's a, it's a cosmetic group uh, structure which has come also similarly. Uh, it's a one a woman uh, game which has come into play. Uh, 
beautifying and so on and so forth. So we have seen uh, large number of these corporations come in. We developed a model uh, which talked about uh, the, the way investment in human resource capital building was done and uh, then they structured the post-investment human resource capital building model. We have test run it on data, we have not tested it on, on an existing firm today. So we are still working on testing it on some existing firm because it involves sensitive data. We are unable to get most of this data. But we have taken some reports where the human resource accounting has been a principle like the Infosys. We have taken data from there and we have tested the model test shown uh, positive results in terms of calibrating what we look for. But as I said, it's not still practically implemented. It was created about three years back. Then the employment market equilibrium model, which is created by us, an aggregate effect on the, the economy. How does this human resource calibration using the MSME segment actually filters into the economic growth? This is how we see the, the informal venture capital grow into corporate venture capital and an institutional venture capital. Similar is the case with the uh, the informal going up in the spill fashion, creating MNEs, and that's how these small firms become large firms. And the growth segment today is much, much faster, and their contribution to the economy is much faster as against what was observed till about 20 years back. It is, it is, the speed is in a huge magnitude today. The way the entrepreneur and the, the functions is simple. Uh, most of it is, most of us know about the angel. Uh, investors, the way venture capitalists work, it goes on in the 20, and that's where the rotation keeps going on as compared to a bank finance which may not actually do that kind of function, which have been prevalent for 100 years through in various countries. I, I'll skip this section, but I'll talk about the model which has been created on the green, green energy, which actually has been implemented by the ECD for three years back. Uh, in India, we have a large amount of work which is being done and in terms of uh, energy consumption and production both in a in renewable source, um, but still much more is needed. We are still not able to create uh, structures. You can see one thing which I would like to show. The way nuclear energy, which has been talked about, even India has now the nuclear energy as a mix. Large number of developed countries, we have seen disaster take place a couple of days ago because of the tsunami, uh, the, the tsunami kind of an effect which took place in one of the cities in Japan. Uh, the, the nuclear energy has been a disaster worldwide. Despite that, we are propagating nuclear energy. And the waste which it produced is the most harmful. It cannot be recycled. It is being done. Finland has offered. Uh, to dump its nuclear waste from worldwide into their country. But that's not something which is sustainable and can create disastrous structures. But we're still reporting this. So there, that's where we need a more sustainable structure. What we have actually uh, proposed is a World Energy Fund where we purchase the technology at the institution like the UN or some other purchase the technology and then offers it uh, to other institutions at a much lower rate. And that's where the economies of scale comes into play. And that's where we talk about some of the things. And this has been, uh, we suggested this at the Swedish parliament and the Finnish parliament uh, in 2009, 2010, the OECD took it up in their OECD forum meeting and proposed it to the world as well. We have to move beyond the third protocol. I will skip this section. Uh, we move on to this growth segment, which is a self-sustaining model which we developed for growth for MSMEs. Uh, and this we have tested on more than 100 corporations, and fortunately, I would say, uh, has brought in good results. Uh, the basic, the whole model works on the fact that you cannot actually lie to yourself. You can't lie to the mirror image. You organize, set up an organization, you give it out to someone to analyze you and say what is good and what is bad is important, it is vital. But then many times you would not give out information which is critical for the organization, thinking that it may lead to disaster for you tomorrow. And that's where you are not able to give the complete information and the analysis is incomplete. In this model, we talk about uh, focusing on some of these uh, issues like vision, leadership, finance, uh, human resource, um, work environment, we have different Olympics to actually go about calibrating the, the values. And one component is kept as one, an open option, whatever you feel is uh, the USP for your organization. But all the others are fixed, and the way it works is that you put them on a scale, and then you evaluate within the board members, if it's a small firm, within your employees, if it's a little medium-sized firm, and then tell them, where do you see uh, 
the vision to be, where do you see the human resource, the work environment which talks about technical resources and equipment development, research and innovation in the organization, market acceptability and leadership and the other option which is, as I said, the USP of the organization. So you, you plot these, you get this data uh, from the organization, the people who actually are your tomorrow, the one who make your tomorrow, and that's those are the most important people. They understand the way leadership has been going, the finances have been moving. From their own perspective, they may not have a complete view, but they do have a more internal view, a more interested view in the organization, and when they give this feedback, you're able to use the up and down index and calculate what we are at. And then you conduct it on a regular basis and see, are you actually improving in each one of these segments, going towards the outer uh, sphere, or not going towards the outer sphere? And this actually helps them refocus and think, oh, I'm not doing good in the research and development, what should I do? in terms of doing, building it up. Oh, I'm not doing good in finance or work environment. People are not happy. That's why my contribution is low in terms of growth. And some of these segments, that's where they come out clearly and categorically in terms of helping. The model, uh, so this is the outlay, how it works. So you may begin from the center. You may go towards the peripheral. You may be looking like something like this. To start with, when you take all this data from different people, collaborate and put it in a scale, and then you need to see how you grow. And this can be done on a regular basis depending on how much time you have. And this does not require too much of competence or too much of uh, empirical analysis for you. But this helps you redevelop, reorient your organization towards a more growth-oriented organization. And we have had large number of corporations uh, in the MSAP segment who have actually benefited this, from this, and they have come back to us and they have thanked us on the fact that uh, this has really helped us refocus because most of the MSME segments, they are entrepreneurial. They know what to do. They know what to do and what to bring about. But they do not know how to go about structuring because they are, many of them actually have had no formal education as well. Even most of them who have had formal education, we have had graduates from IIT Delhi who started these companies who are running it very well, but they do not know, oh, I did not know finance was so important. Oh, I did not know R&D could make so much of a difference in terms of the growth of my organization. Oh, I did not know that my people were not so happy with the environment which I was providing. I was thinking I'm doing the best for them. I have picked up these models from different countries, the BCG reports and so on and so forth, but still I did not know they were not happy with the, the structure that was happening. One organization, one public sector undertaking, they said, we did not know that they did not know our leadership. They did not know what was the mission of the organization. Most employees did not know what was the leadership mission or the vision of the organization. And they were just working as a routine work. They were employed in the public sector undertaking. They were taking it, or oh, this was the job, so they were doing the job, and that's over. Well, how would they work? How would they make the organization grow? And that was not one. And this fortunately helped them restructure it in a very simple manner because it believes on one concept that you don't like to the mirror. You don't like your own self. And that's where it functions. And this can be constrained to any specific zone. It can be constrained to the board level. It can be constrained within the organization. You can even include your customers to go about uh, including it. So it can be, it is flexible in terms of who all can be there in terms of functionality. Now this was the goal programming model which has been developed. As I said, this test run on, on uh, various companies. We have only about three companies which have tested in practicality, but the rest are yet to be tested. And the results could be, since we started three years back, we are still yet to see. We would like to span up about five years minimum to really come out with concrete results, how it has been benefited. But in the last three years, the organizations have shown a good growth in terms of their orientation. The way it works is uh, based on past theories, liberalization, and uh, the way it uh, does its prime objective to develop model for capital structure decisions with multiple objectives and constraints for firm. Most firms, even today, they work with single objectives. They say we cannot target multiple objectives. But given the dynamicity of environment, it is not possible to work in a single objective structure. And that's where the multi-objective framework comes into place. Uh, so this was initially developed with the help of uh, surveys conducted from CFOs and then further, as I said, has been tested. Uh, we identified decision variables, formulation of objectives and goals, and then the, the expenditure for each goal was done giving priorities to these goals, that's the simple goal programming model with structures and identification of selection 96 possible considerations and 67 qualified out of them. So we have a large variable set which you can actually look at from the objective structure. Identifying the priorities through interviews on surveys, three companies, industry specific constraints were taken and firm specific constraints were taken. And the, the function uh, actually came to this. Uh, the detailed work is is there published in a book now, form, as well as it is there in papers published in various terms uh, in the US and in India as well. Some of the constraints which have been taken, 
this is from one of the firms. Uh, we cannot disclose the name and the confidentiality, but this data was taken test from them and they are getting paid with that. Goal programming model for capital structure decision contributing to the global the, the goal programming model, which is the working model incorporating flexibility and design decision makers. The most important component why we did this was basically the function of the fact that in a dynamic environment today we have more large number of functions, large number of sources of financing. The, the, the capital is no longer debt or equity. You have venture capitalist funds, you have mutual funds, you can raise ECBs, you can raise other components. And as a result, and this is not only restricted to large firms, even MSMEs are actually benefiting from these. Private equity firms have come into place in India. They are financing some of these MSME operations, small, small operations. And that's where the dynamicity in the, in the model of the capital structure which we follow has to be there, and we cannot stick to one. As I said, in large corporations it becomes difficult because they have to seek large number of approvals of restructuring the, the capital structure. But when it comes to MSME, which is the micro, the small micro would be uh, like one man firm, like the Hotmail.com was a micro firm initially, uh, or you know, similarly other organizations, but the medium size. Now this also definition varies from country to country because in various countries they have these boards which have set up what will be the levels based on the net worth. Uh, which will define them as micro or medium or small scale industries and so on and so forth. Uh, so it, we have not restricted ourselves. So depending on the country, we talk about the MSME, but we have seen this uh, can be implemented by them very comfortably because they, they have only a small group of people who they have to take uh, structures from. Organic agriculture has come into play in a big way. 70% uh, as I said in India in specific is engaged in agriculture. Uh, today, because of recession, large number of people who hail from some of these towns have gone back and set up uh, MSME agro based industries. Large number of financing and other institutions, as I'll talk later, uh, are actually involved in terms of getting them up. And this is now benefiting the country not in terms of the, not only in terms of food security, which is in place, which is a major concern for large companies. Countries, I met some senior executives of the FAO in, of, uh, about four or five years back. And I remember they were talking about major concerns about food security which governments are. There is not much discussion on food security uh, by the various governments, but it's a major issue uh, with the kind of uh, disparities, the kind of problems which are coming up, food security has become an issue. Organic agriculture, India, unfortunately because of non-development of financial structures and uh, technological developments and laid-back technology which was sold to farmers, could not move on to the latest technology. There were no finances. Bank finances were not available till about 10, 15 years back. No credit cards for farmers. So there were no, none of these structures were there. As a result, they had no option but to do the traditional way of farming. Today, the traditional way of farming has been a benefit because now you produce organic-based agriculture still, and that sells in the markets in Europe and the US at four to five times the price. And you're able to earn, even if you get the same price which you are getting in Europe, you're able to earn a huge chunk of money in foreign exchange and much better than what you supply to the local market. And that's where the organic agriculture has become a boom. And that's where we have seen large number of joint ventures. We have seen joint ventures between Israel and India. They have come in India, in Punjab and Haryana. They set up some joint venture firms, which are in the MSME segment, producing and supplying to Israel and the rest of the Europe. We have seen some French firms come in uh, to have tie up in the last 10 years. Last three years back, we had some German firms come in uh, to do joint venture uh, or a merger with some MSME segments to produce some of these. Now, because these farms are held by small, small farmers and there is a huge amount of defragmentation of land, it is not possible for them to actually go to a company and say, you do this job for us. So those large corporation structures, which used to exist about 15, 20 years back, that a farm comes, goes talk to a big farm, they die up with them and then that farm goes back, is not prevalent. They've cut them down, they directly go to a small farmer or a panchayat and they talk to them and they get the structure up in place. And that's where the growth in the MSME segment has they reboosted and organic agriculture has helped them. We have fortunately done some work on financing of agriculture in terms of we were the first one to propose the launch of a credit card, which was fortunately accepted in 98 by the government of India to create the uh, Kisan credit card uh, because a farmer to go to a bank, then take talk to the bank manager to get some money out for seeds or for manure or whatever, he needed to bribe him uh, to, to rub the farm, as we say to get that small money also. And then there was a big problem. And so today, he can go using his credit card, buy these products, not only from within the country, from anywhere in the world, shipped to him 
comfortably, which was not. And this has empowered the growth of financing for agriculture within the country to some extent. Still, the use of credit cards is very nascent in India, even in the retail segment, but we are seeing the growth coming up. We are still in the development phase of credit cards, which in the United States was in 1960s. So we can imagine the way the growth of the credit card business is growing in India, but it is going at a much faster pace with the ease which people realize uh, one can get finances and uh, can actually operate uh, trouble free. Uh, I will skip this segment also. We have suggested this uh, operating regional monetary funds. This has been in debate. Um, one of the suggestions that we did was to create a regional bank, which the big bank has actually come into place recently. This was proposed by the former uh, Prime Minister Atikai Vajpayee after we suggested this. Uh, in his previous tenure, the current government, which is the BJP government in place, uh, had a tenure almost about a decade back, and that time the, the uh, Prime Minister took our model up of creating a regional development bank uh, to SART and suggested that they may create a SART uh, fund uh, bank. Fortunately, it was not SART, but in the BRICS, have uh, created the BRICS bank on the same structure which we proposed almost about 13 years back. So we, we feel happy that at least some development on that front is there. Uh, apart from that, we have suggested regional monetary funds uh, in the sense that, and we are proposing this because uh, the IMF has been criticized now to create a model and then subjected to different countries. Each country has its own structure. If there is a regional monetary fund and the IMF takes a parental role as having grown and having so much knowledge, then they, the regions can actually go about remodeling that model which is best suited. Now the Islamic region has Islamic banking and financing. It is not the way finances work in the rest of the world. They need to restructure. You cannot implement what was implemented maybe in, uh, in uh, Ecuador or in Colombia or in Brazil. A model fund function for the Arabic region. Now, the region understands its requirements. Every region has its own needs and requirements. South Asia is very different from East Asia. And that's where, despite the fact that they're Asia, it doesn't mean they're the same. East Asia is very different. And they can understand and remodel those structures. And that's where the need for the region monetary fund and the IMF taking the parental role is critical. But the IMF doesn't want to lose. As it happens in various companies, where if it's a family run company, the father is running the company then they don't want to give it to their child, not have, not because they don't have confidence, because they don't want to lose power. They feel they will be dysfunctional tomorrow. They would not, so he won't sustain himself till the time he can. And that's where succession planning has become a very critical component in the remodeling, the structure and technique growth. Ratan Data retired after announcing for almost about a decade back that he wants to retire and has put in someone else's reign now to depart. If he did not, then he would have continued till he died and then there would be a vacuum which would be created. And that's where the problem comes in. The IMF is not understanding this, it's grown, it's a huge organization, it has beautiful structures and models, but they need to be restructured according to the needs. And that's what we have been focusing for the last 10 years in various forms that they need to come up. There has been debate, but no concrete steps because of not losing their power which they have. Uh, the WTO uh, is a very critical component uh, which has actually boosted growth. Uh, there is a risk which large developed countries have actually come on face to face in the last two years where they say today their own corporations are suffering at the cost of the WTO. And the reason is now they are facing competition, they are not able to uh, compete, their own people are losing jobs, and as a result they would like to stop. Uh, an argument which was given way back in 1990, early 1990, by a large number of emerging markets uh, when these American firms and European firms would come in to the developed region, and that was the reason. They have emerged, they have remodulated themselves, they restructured themselves, they have made their products more qualitative in nature, and today it has become a challenge for a large part of the developed world where uh, they can actually not sustain their competition coming in from some of these developing regions for various products which are being supplied. You see, America today has the, last, the strongest purchasing power, followed by India and China. But the purchasing power in the United States is at the count of imports, cheap imports. Almost all products, except for the top-end products like defense equipment, everything is imported. Now they can account for it because they have this money by selling oil or arms. But this is not sustainable. Tomorrow, if you don't not able to, if you are not able, then what will happen? The same product manufactured in the United States would cost at least five or six times. Where would the purchasing part disappear? India does not manufacture very efficient goods or services, but then it manufactures from the needle to the satellites. And that's where the difference comes into play. The purchasing power of India, which is the second best in the world, comes from the fact that it produces, this purchasing power is inbuilt in the mechanism. It is not imported from outside. And that makes it a little more sustainable as compared to the way it is functioning in the United States. 
today we have seen in the last 100 to 100 years different countries have had have been at the top uk enjoyed a top position india 500 years back enjoyed greece at one point of time enjoyed where is greece today at shackles at, at the position where they are where they before various international agencies requesting for some funds people fighting each other now that was a civilization which was at the top of fair everyone wanted to go to greece at one point of time greece civilization was one of the richest civilizations most advanced civilizations, technology, science and technology, archaeological, so everything was on the top most, but today is nowhere. We should not forget these reorientations take place every decade, two decades, three decades going forward, and that's where the United States needs to understand that importing purchasing power would not really help them grow, and that's where the role of the WTO needs to be reemerged and restructured and brought into place because this has actually benefited the MSME segment uh, to a large extent as against large corporations and the MSME segment worldwide, even in the United States, houses the largest amount of people in their country. And that's where the, the importance for sustainable development and growth in the respective countries is important. Now, coming to India, we have had, uh, we never called the MSME as MSME. Initially, uh, post independence, they were called small scale industries. Uh, till about uh, uh, 12 or 13 years back, the definition was small scale industries. Uh, small scale industries included all, from micro to, to the medium size as well. And the, the benefit here was, was one term, there were bare banks, financial institutions which were created, like the IDBI, the SIDBI, the IFCI, the NABAD, and others. Each one of them have different functions. IDBI functions development into hard core areas like infrastructure, power, and so on and so forth. SIDBI finances smaller operations, uh, whether it's a manufacturing unit and so on and so forth. Uh, the IFCI finances all kinds of operations again, it's a development bank which finances all kinds of operations, whether it's setting a small industry or in infrastructure or in any, any area. NABAD is focused on agriculture only, does provide financing only for agriculture, and then the sectoral financing institution which has been set up. Now, it was easy because if you fall, fell into the criteria of the SSI, even the hospitality, hospitality industry, hotels would form a part of the SSI. Two star hotels, three star hotels, four star hotels would form a part of the SSI. And that's where it was easy. But today, then they reformed it because worldwide, there was nothing like SSI. They would talk about SMEs. And everyone knew the term SME, so it was revamped as an SME. And lately, about three years back, then there was a ministry formed uh, to look into this. Separate ministry was created called the Ministry of MSME. And the reason my crew was added was because there today, one man firm, a one man idea, a venture capitalist firm which comes into play. He has an idea, he creates a structure, he is ready to, he patents his product and then goes forward. And that's where he needs to be financed. And he is an organization, he is a setup. Whether it's a sole proprietorship firm or a private firm or a, a public limited firm, but it's a one man structure, it's a micro firm. And that's where micro firms had also now started playing a critical role. Why? A lot of institutions worldwide, business schools, have been talking about creating entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship being the, the skill. Now, uh, an entrepreneur will not be large for number of four, five, six people will not tend to create an entrepreneur because there's a risk of the idea being uh, being lost. And that's where we saw Facebook, which came into picture where this movie talks about the fact that the idea was, he did have some idea, some idea about what he wanted to do, but then there was already a group at Harvard who was actually looking at creating a setup. They told them what they were doing, what they had thought about for their own group specifically. He enlarged that idea and used that idea. He had someone who was able to finance it. So there was a one-man show, but then it was something which was built up. So there's a risk of the idea being lost, and that's where most entrepreneurial firms are micro firms in one man affair. And that's why the need for the micro financing was there, and the MSME segment came into play. The World War both one and two, we saw large firms disappear, went into huge losses. They could not sustain themselves. But small firms, they were manufacturing clothes, shirts, army now needed army dresses, they started manufacturing army dresses. They were manufacturing shoes, army needed shoes, they started manufacturing army shoes. The MSMEs could remodel themselves because there was not huge uh, machinery cost which was there. They were manufacturing small, small parts, they started manufacturing parts for the army machine. Now, this could be more modern. They could restructure the orientation because they were a small firm. They could do that orientation. A large firm could not. And that's where we see the MSME segment showing growth and, and sustainability. The way in India we have changed seen in the SME segment is they, they followed a public-private partnership which was there. 
which was more public and they are coming into play, the government will come help them with IFCI or NABAR under various schemes to set up their firms. It was not a venture financing at that time, but simple uh, debt lending which was done to them. At that time, even grants given to them between 85 and 97. Post 97, there was a change in financing pattern where we had came to the PPP model of ADP. The difference between the previous PPP model and the new PPP model is that you now have a third party which comes from overseas. In the previous PP model, it was the government and the Indian enterprise. Today, and they were putting, the Indian enterprise would put some money and would put some stake and put the project on the ground. But now the PPP model talks about that there will be three parties to a contract, where be the government will be part of it, whether it is in terms of the financing, whether it is in terms of giving allocation of land or regulation, or in terms of providing know-how. The outside party from overseas will come in either with finances or know-how. The the party in India would actually put the project on ground. They can also put in finances and know-how, but the prime objective, prime duty would be for them would be to put the project on ground. And that is what the ADB has been uh, talking about. Uh, and that's where the, the public-private partnership of the ADB model differs from the public-private partnership, the PV model which we followed in India prior to 1997. And that's what they, and we are seeing this develop. Now this PPP model is not only being implemented by the MSME, but is implemented by large corporations. The other day, uh, the last year, this year, earlier this year in May, we had the ADB meeting in Kazakhstan, and there they talked about the, the sanitations, the water purification model. Now they're using some of these NGOs and micro firms to help them do it. They're not, they've not contacted a large firm, like the Sulab is one of the organizations which they're using which is a private NGO structure which has been created to clean up the, the places, to create structures. And that's where the, the ADB is bringing in technology from some country. They have this company which is already in place to set up it on the ground. The government is funding partly and the ADB is funding partly. And that's where the PPP model has become more prevalent in terms of providing these structures. Uh, the, the area which we see, I'll show you some tables. We have more tables in our paper. Uh, the MSME accounts for about 45% of the India's manufacturing output. Now this is the only official information that we have, that is in the regulated sector, not in the unregulated sector. The unregulated sector is about 70% of the total regulated sector. Regulated is a very small sector. So 45% of the regulated sector has uh, the MSME, accounts for about 40% of total exports, employs about 73 million people in more than 31 million units spread across India. In financial year 2011, the total production of MSME was about uh, uh, 10 trillion dollars, 10 trillion, and in, 10 trillion dollars, and an increase of about 11 percent in financial year. The MSME has in the outperformed uh, the Indian, uh, the industrial uh, production figures and the GDP growth rates in the past five years. The total production of MSME has been 10 billion, that is of, at the price level of base level of 2001, two, and so on and so forth. So you know, there, we have seen. Uh, the, the structure which have been there, the data clearly, evidently, and as I am saying, it is only the regulated sector. It is not the unregulated sector, which we are talking about. So regulated sector, we have seen this growth. We are looking at the kind of impetus which it provides in the regulated sector. Some of the, the data from going back to 1949, uh, at that time we had 3758 SSIs, uh, which grew in 1950 to 5305 SSIs. Again, in the regulated sector, these are not unregulated uh, numbers. In three million handloom workers were there, different segments of industry which housed different people, the way uh, they were contributing in terms of growth in different segments. 1956, the Industrial Corporation Society, who are with 7,000 uh, 7, uh, companies, industrial cooperative going, going to 37,000 within a span of about five years. 65, Khadi Group, and again, as I said, all regulated again here. Yeah. The total number of people which are employed, the total number of production levels. And you can really see the way the growth actually has been taking place. It is visible on a year-to-year -year basis. From 2005 to 2010. Uh, the lakhs is 1 million, it's 1.1 million roughly from lakhs. Uh, that's the Indian term value for, uh, for currencies, crores and lakhs. So you can see, 9, 10, we had about uh, 41 uh, million uh, units from just mere 3,000 50 years back. And uh, then the total employment was roughly about 88 million, again in the regulated segment. And this is the total work which has been created. That means 
about uh, uh, roughly about seven nine trillion uh, rupees, which is inflated by them. Again, as I said, regulated, which is only about forty percent global market, which comprises of the MSME. Now, characteristics in terms of rural, urban areas, the SSIs, ancillary units, number of units, tiny. For women enterprises have been growing in a big way. The government has also created a women's bank, uh, segregated only to target and facilitate women functioning. And there has been a huge focus in terms of the way women can be utilized. Uh, all this, it's not that their functioning in the past has been discounted, but they were not uh, in a major way in the workforce, or at least not accounted for. Even today, if you go to villages, and I'm, I'm shocked when I go to some of these uh, countryside areas, 80% uh, of the time, the women are working on the fields. The men only come in when it comes to sow and when it comes to reap the, the fruits. In the whole period of the agriculture produced, it is the women who actually work. You can read in newspapers in Asia, various countries, if it doesn't rain, it's the women who start praying to the God for the rain to come so that they can have produce. It is never, we have never seen the men come in picture for this. So it is not that they have not been working, but their contributions have not been actually acknowledged in the past and that they have not been accounted. Fortunately, now the government has tried to focus, has tried to bring that component in and account for that component of growth which women do and is ready to finance. There is a tax break which has been there for the last 20 years now. If a, a woman is a chief executive of a, a company, the chairman of the board, then they get a 5% break in the taxes. So many companies have actually introduced women and in the last four or five years, once they are there on the board, they become an active role player. In the first year, they're more momentary, where they just there, they sign the document, and then they go back home with a good check, which gives them a good happiness that, look, I have got this money was just sitting on a chair and signing, not knowing what is happening in the board or in the company. But within a year, two years, three years of sitting on the boards and board meetings, they have come to know more and as a result they have become more active players today. And we have large number of uh, firms, large firms and even medium sized firms which are actually women led firms today for the purpose of tax benefit plus otherwise which they are benefiting. And we have seen them grow on an annual basis and that's where the role of the women have grown. Uh, in enterprises, this I told you about the, the firm Richard Popper was an initiative of women. There have been other initiatives on the cooperative function which have been created only by women, clubbing together and creating one. And it was not one person, but going together. In different segments, again, partnership firms, cooperatives, the way the total SSI sector is both in registered and the unregistered. Unregistered numbers are calibrated. They are not exact, but they are from government data, so it's not hypothetical. The way uh, we have a s some segment of classes which, which are also there, the SCSPs, which are uh, the people who are very small in number, very micro in number, and that's where they have been categorized as well. The, some of the indigenous structures which have been there in place for financing of MSMEs have been the, the panchayats. The panchayats have been a system of running a village. Uh, it is, panchayat is five, so five members in a village who form a group would become the panchayat, the, the, the structure which will actually govern the whole village and it has been a system existing for over centuries now in India and they are trying to integrate that with the government functioning. They have been the ones who have actually helped large number of organizations uh, to come up, large number of structures. So even if you want to go in a village today, uh, even large farms which have to go, they actually have to go through the panchayats, uh, otherwise it will not function well. Although individual has the capacity to go forward, do tie-ups, but it will not go forward. It is the panchayat which helps and facilitates to a great extent. So there is a head, which is called the Sarpas, the head of the, the panchayat, with five member team. So it's, they do almost all kinds of structures. They do legal issues, they do resolving of finances, they do structuring of the village, what land goes to whom, who can own the land, to certify does he own the land or not own the land. There are government structures also, but then he is uh, more super, uh, super, uh, superior to most of them. And that's where the role of the panchayat comes into play in terms of financing. We have something called chit funds. Now, about four or five years back, you might have seen when the banks, when this whole thing started in 2008, and they were no, uh, they didn't want to go for a bailout because that would mean government intervention into the banking framework. What did they do? They were about 10 banks which said, came together and said, each one of us will pull in $1 million. So they created a fund of $10 million. Okay, and then they said, now since we have pulled in this money, any bank which is in trouble or has financial problems can come forth to us and take this money from us. 
Now this is nothing else but what a chit fund is. Most people in villages, in small town, in rural, urban areas, everywhere, they meet on a regular basis, so they will go for friends or family, they will put in some money of their own, what they earn in this, they will create a fund, and then if that fund is taken away by one of the members, whoever needs that money for that particular time. And then there is a loan system which they have created where one pays back and the rest of them immediately get their interest at that same spot itself. So a proportion of that money goes in terms of payment of interest to each one of the rest of the members and then he takes the balance funds and returns the total money including the interest to them within a span of about 10, year, 10 months or 11 months. Now the reason it is sustainable is because these are known people. They'll, the possibility of a fraud is very low. Secondly, there is no written documents so the money keeps circulating. And it finds its good, reasonable place because it would be lying somewhere in someone's account or someone's home. Now it is being used in terms of growth and development of the business which they are having. Now these kinds of chit funds are operating in millions in every small town. These are not which are operating in few hundred thousands. Are they part of the regulatory framework of financing? They are not. Do they come under their purview? Not. Some of the large chit funds have bought themselves registered as the NBFC, but large number of them never come into play. No one comes to know who is. And that's where the mechanism of financing goes. Now this is, as I said, in the US, they adopted this. Now this, the way they did it in the US was a formal structure. They had an agreement, they gave this fund, and anyone could take this money, uh, because the depository institution, the, the, the guarantor was not ready to take care and could not provide for the defaults and banks. And the same structure, we just followed at a micro level, and has been there for over a century now. It is not something new. And the reason is that the businessmen have a, a huge amount of fund which they are able to educate and they are able to do away. Nidhi is, a, is again a similar kind of a fund like the, the IMF did, but this is in the formal sector. The government has created Nidhi institutions where funds are poured in by people and these funds can actually be then used in by various companies and structures can be created. And this is again a structure which is very indigenous. Earlier we used to be named with the following names, but the government names it as Nidhi Companies. So it is part of the Ministry of MSME where they promote the creation of Nidhi Companies in small townships where people become in fund, so it is in the regulated segment. They are trying to replace it in fund because if there is one person who frauds, the money disappears, so there is a debacle. And no recourse because legally they can't action, there can be no action taken. But in case of Nidhi, there is legal structure and everything is there. Microfinancing schemes, uh, various banks and financial institutions, uh, apart from those which are specifically targeted for specific areas, have the microfinancing scheme for micro enterprises. Sorry. Then we have the SIFB, uh, it was the Indus and Development Bank of India was created for financing like the IFCI. There was a need felt immediately in the 1950s and SIFB was created which would only finance small scale industries. The role would be only to look at small scale industries. So a targeted bank was created to finance only small scale industries for any kind of requirement there. Whether it was machinery, whether it was taking loans, whether it was setting up a plant, whether it was buying a land, whether it was working capital financing, anything. They would do all kinds of financing and SIPI had played a critical role and you have seen the numbers, the way they have actually grown in the sense of figures of the SSI and that has been primarily. Grameen Bank, a concept which is known as Bangladesh's concept because the World Bank tested this model on Bangladesh, has been there for over a hundred years in India, functioning and prevalent. It's more like a cooperative banking and where people come together, they collect funds again, create a cooperative bank, then that does the banking activities and different activities in that area. Now this is what, as I said, was functioning for over 100. But since the Nobel Prize was given and then Bangladesh it was tested on and it proved to, prove to be fruitful, everywhere around the world believes it is a Bangladesh's. Not to forget that Bangladesh was part of India long back. It's only, it's only been 50, 60 years that 65 years that Bangladesh is a separate entity, but it was part of India and that's where the, the concept had been tested and was existing there. Then we have something called cooperative banks. Now in Europe and US, you have something called fund institutions. I can work with the, the, the World Bank and the IMF and they had an IMF bank fund. So in a large number of corporations which are 
away from the main cities who have offices away, they create their own fund institutions, which is run by the employees, they have funds of the employees and the people who are working there, and that's where the fund institutions. Similarly, the cooperative banks are a group of people who come in together, they create a cooperative fund, and then it gives out preferential rates to those people who are their fund owners, and apart from that, to others as well, to make profitability. So, but it is restrained in terms of operations. A normal commercial bank can go anywhere and set up its branches. A cooperative bank cannot go anywhere and set up. They can. They are only constant to the area. Similar is the case with the fund banks. IMF and World Bank, uh, IMF World Bank fund could not just go and set up offices anywhere. They have to be within the IMF and World Bank domain within DC if they have to do operations. We have this institution called NABARD. Uh, NABARD uh, is again uh, uh, a financing institution. As I said. It is meant only for agriculture, it finances research projects, innovation projects, it finances agriculture growth, green uh, financing and so on, so on green, uh, greenhouse packing and so on, so on, they finance those kind of projects as well, uh, even solar based projects, machinery you want to set up for. So all those kind of projects which are related to agriculture are typically financed through the NABAR. So the government gives the Ministry of Agriculture and the Reserve Bank of India would release the funds through the ministries to the NABAR and then NABAR will distribute it to various other banks and financial institutions. Even commercial banks who want to give loans for agriculture, they would actually come to NABAR and take these preferential rate funds which are given out for agriculture. And that's where NABAR acts as a more of a, a, a top institution for directly giving as well as through other institutions. We have local money lenders and prawn brokers as we call them. I remember about 14-15 years back the ADB approached us after the Asian financial crisis in 95-97. Uh, they approached us that uh, the banks are flushed in funds in 2000 or 2001, but uh, people are not picking up funds. You have these Indian people living in Philippines, and these people, husband and wife, they go on a bicycle from one shop to the other, one vendor to the other, gives them in the morning, uh, takes almost 100% return, collects the money in the evening. And that's the way they have been doing microfinancing. And it's very successful. Why are they not coming up to the banks? We are flushed with funds still. Fine, uh, the old things were there, but the regulations have been reduced and we have not by the not so they ask us to, to study and explain. The, the local money lender seems to have huge costs in terms of interest payment, but it is at convenience. It comes to you, no paper requirement, no documentation requirement, you go to a bank or financial institution, you know, they will ask you a set of documents, you don't have them, sorry we can't give you. They may have lengthy processes. Despite the reduction, it is, the KYC norms do not allow a concept which was floated by us and accepted by the World Bank in the IMF in 2004, again, does not happen. Uh, I have five minutes or ten minutes? Okay. Yeah. No, no, five, five, five minutes. minutes. Five minutes. Sure. So, uh, the, the, the local money lenders, in, in, in India, a villager, a, a small agriculturist, he does not have fund, his wife is in labor, needs money at the middle of night or three o'clock in the night, no bank and financial institution will be ready to finance that kind of operation. He goes to a hospital, they have no credit card system of making payments. He goes to a money lender, he knocks out the door, the money lender knows he has a small piece of land, he will never repay me the money, he takes a stamp on a blank piece of paper, pledges his life. But what is his life worth if he doesn't have a wife and child? At least he is able to save them, he is able to repay in whatever form they can. Yes, the cost is high, doesn't bank charge the similar way? They need, know that I have need for money, they will charge me high interest rate, they will ask me to use number of documents. They know that I don't have need, they are coming to me, they will give me at lower rates of interest. Now this is the way the financial industry works, there is a cost to the fund and the cost depends on what your needs are. And similar is the case with the, 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 the local money lenders. They give you money to do business, if you don't have that money, you can't even grow further. And that's where their functionality in the Indian economy has still been very crucial and critical in terms of the growth, the way MSME segment has actually grown, without asking any documents. Without having any know-how. They know you, oh you are a villager, that's enough for me. They will not. 3 o'clock in the night you come to them, they will give you money. 2 o'clock in the night, whatever moods they are, they will give you money. They will never say no. That's where the case with pawn brokers are. Pawn brokers are a little larger size than money lenders. Local money lenders are smaller size. Legit power, as I said, this food product which is made, again, uh, over 50 years, grown into a large organization. The product is available in almost all retail shops today. But a product which is made by small, small people, villages, women of different, different houses in villages. And that's how it comes to the market and they earn some part of their livelihood. White Revolution which took close, dairy milk and all, and Amul, other product, also a big company now, 
they have also produced some of these products. So, milk is collected from various villages and then club together, and <coughs> you have the dairy milks which come in. Again, uh, a micro finance structure which still exists at a micro structure. It's not grown into a large corporation, although it's a major group member, one name, but then the, the products are poured in from small institutions. Uh, I'll just take one, two more minutes to complete. Uh, the Uzbek model, uh, I'll not discuss more, but we have had the Uzbek model which the President launched about a decade back, which has actually been improved. Uh, gradual approach on transition, uh, sub-state, state level development, aimed at importing substitution, import uh, substituting industrialization, which is the main focus of this. Energy and food self-sufficiency has been in the focus, which they are trying to do. And the, the, emer the how, um, engaging household women and unemployed workforce has been a critical component of this model. And that's what they have actually tried to rebuild on, to utilize this resource and you know, bring in development. Fortunately for them, uh, about they have had a GDP growth despite the region's debacle of anywhere about 8 to 9 percent, consistent in the last four or five years, despite what is happening around the world. And so that's where we can see that this model has reaped some fruits. Then they also introduced the, the bicameral parliament in Olympia, which is the, the parliament which became more proactive in terms of bringing in democratic structures and creating institutions. And that's where, again, the Olympia, which has been playing a very proactive role in the last 10 years, uh, contributing to the growth. Although the parliament does not come in play, but then they have been. The, the, the focal point in the development of these institutions. Then there was an anti crisis program launched in 2009 and 2012, again refocused on the way growth would take place. The prime focus was here again the MSME sector. They did not focus on large corporations, they did not focus on international corporations, but the focus was MSME segments. Uh, one more minute and then over. Uh, the financial growth of MSMEs, some of the segments which we use in the banks, is the criminal sector is testing. I remember a case of Chile where they had a debacle almost about 25, 30 years back, where financially they had actually sold out all their institutions to large corporations worldwide, thinking of risk transfer mechanism to work, which did not work. These organizations club have said, you bail us out or we move out, and the government of Chile had to bail them out. And after that, they made it mandatory for all banking financial institutions on a regular basis, on a daily basis, to report to newspapers about their financial uh, positions. And on the bottom of a newspaper, they would have on a regular basis what were the networks and the financials and the NPA levels on a daily basis. Now, some of these steps have to be taken care. As I said, the banking industry is still not setting the house in order. And that's where, despite the American banks doing this kind of test, they are not projecting them. There is no report that comes out from the Federal Reserve System which talks about what the results have been. And that's where they need to work on some of this. Financial literacy has been a very critical component. My colleague and friend, People from it from Sweden have been working extensively on this, and it has been found that even large top bankers uh, do not know what is the role of financial products. Most bankers even do not know that derivative is a risk hedging tool. It is not uh, only money making tool, and they, that's where they project in a wrong way, and that's where the financial literacy plays an important role, not only to the common man or the investor, but even to the bankers themselves. Uh, too big to fail as a concept is no more there. Uh, today, developing region is burning at the cost of the crisis of more develop, developing regions, uh, and we need to bring in fiscal discipline. The last line, uh, what Buddha said, I feel is a very critical component. Before that, we need to lay stress on social security facilities, environment, social equilibrium, business, and economic growth. What Buddha said, I would like to close with that. Uh, uh, that is, uh, in my opinion, it is the right view, the right speech, the right living, the right thoughts, the right decisions, the right action, the right struggle. Very difficult approach. It's a multi. It's a goal programming approach. You have to have multiple targets simultaneously. Uh, you know, uh, Buddha maybe having being a uh, king from India could target this with his luxuries, but uh, I don't know if a common man can. But one still needs to achieve that. What is most important is that we need to have trust and confidence uh, in holding uh, the key to growth and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Agarwal. We are a little delayed, but uh, the, we would like to accept uh, several questions. So the, we uh, would like to start the next session 15 minutes uh, later. So the, uh, do you have any questions? Okay, yeah, can I have a technical question sure. on the 
multi-objective optimization. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Because multi-objective optimization, either you use the whole Pareto set, and then you still produce a lot of options, and somebody needs to decide. True. Or you just combine them into a single objective. No, no, we don't combine them into a single objective. Okay. We have multi, that's where the, the structure is 90, 967 have actually been uh, taken as the ones which are... Uh, so what do you... So you just give them the list of... Scenarios. Yes, we assign them goals, we assign them priorities, like which one of the objectives is more more important than the other, and that is subjectively decided between the discussion group, uh, the top management, and then we prioritize them, and then we uh, take them as together. But not as a single objective, the multi objective. Oh, right. okay. So you produce several scenarios? Yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. Like linear. Yeah, it's very it's linear, linear program. So we have 67 qualifiable uh, variable sets which we take into account and they're taken together, they're not uh, combined into one. So who, who makes the final decision? No so once you have... Right, uh, optimization. The, uh, because the linear, uh, we can obtain the uh, optimal solution. No, but it's not one optimal solution because you have several objective functions. True. Yeah, so you have the whole uh, Pareto set of yes, optimal yes, solutions. Yes. yes. Uh, not uh, the uh, non-linear problem. It doesn't you matter. You the linear problem. Right? It, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a good programming approach. We don't use linear approach. No, but you have linear. You have linear. We have linear to begin with, and then we move on to the next. Right, right, and then right. now we're working on the stochastic good programming approach. And who decides? So the company itself. The so board. The board will decide. The board decides. The board decides. Okay. So the parameters are decided, and then the board decides on that. How about other questions? I have uh, yes. also several questions. In Japan, the uh, uh, small the uh, company share is 35 okay. uh, for the industrial the, uh, output and the export also 35. And in India, you told it the 45 and the 40. Correct. And the, the, I think uh, if the small company have a much share. Maybe uh, the, the, the influence on the world market or the, in the, uh, the uh, national market uh, has a uh, very low. The if we would, would like to have uh, the influence, large influence, we should have a big share. Uh, and the small company cannot have a big share by itself. Totally, it's of course, be okay, but uh, these all companies uh, do behave a bit different. Uh, how do you think yes, about uh, the global the, uh, economy? I, I'll answer it in three points. Firstly, in Japan, you have regularized sector, most of it. Maybe 10% may be unregularized, but the rest is all regularized. So when it say 35%, it means actually 35%. In India, the unregulated sector is over 60%. That means that uh, the 40% that you're talking about is only the, that 40% the total market share. So it's a very small component which we have in terms of calibration of uh, data which is there. In real terms, it will be much more. No, no, no. My question is... Uh, I'm, I'm coming to that part. Whether the, you... Uh, my question is whether you are emphasizing to grow the, the uh, micro and small the company, the, the uh, share, or the concentrating, uh, or the growing the big company. No, we, we are focusing largely, most of the policies, the reason for the government, after so many years, to create the ministry, a separate ministry to focus on the MSME, the, apart yes, from, is the, there. Even in Japan, uh, we are emphasizing the, the small and micro company, that uh, the input we would like to be, uh, big share in the world. Yes, I've, you see, we are not so critical about the big share in the world market. Uh, you will be, you see, diamonds, we are the largest exporters of diamonds in front of India. They are top, and they are small micro firms which do it. Now, despite the fact that we are the largest exporter of diamonds, we are not the one to decide on the pricing of diamonds. Secondly, we are the largest uh, importers of gold in the world. Almost two-thirds of the total gold production is imported in India. Now, despite being the largest consumer of gold, we are not the ones who decide on the gold price. So similarly, we are we have some of the other products where we consume large, but we are not the ones who decide on what they are. So our the focus of the government or the people has never been to 
buy the share or take the share in the global market. But yes, we would like to contribute and that contribution, both in terms of numbers, in terms of revenue, has been growing in a multifold manner. Uh, the, now the role of the government is to actually convert some of these unregulated segment MSMEs to regulated because the unregulated MSMEs are unable to get some of these social benefits like health benefits, uh, other benefits uh, because they are in the unregulated segment. If they come into the regulated segments from the government and even from private enterprises, they will be able to get these benefits. And the social benefit of the citizen who is working there, laborer who is working there, would be much higher. And that's where the focus is to shift them. So and also bring about more dynamism. And we are seeing that growth coming. So there is a more play of the share of pie, but it is not from the position of a dominating position which we may want overseas, uh, but it is from the point of that the people at the end benefit from this activity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how about uh, another question? Is it okay? So the, right now the uh, time is 38, so the uh, starting time is 10.30, uh, but uh, we would like to do a, the, the uh, uh, 45.50. So 20 minutes to the end. So why don't you return to the room, the 10.40, no, the 10.50. So the 20 minutes to the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, why don't you read the... Uh, it's here. Yes, it is here. It is here, in the computer.